Okay, unfortunately, we are right to the end of our session, but the good news is that we will have to end Professor Giancarlo Cortizos from the Andes University here in Bogota, Colombia with the talk, the one-dimensional logarithmic diffusion equation. So go ahead, Professor Cortizo. Thank you, John. Well, uh, I, I must thank, first thank the organizers for having me or giving me the opportunity to give a talk at this uh, session. So many thanks to you. So, well, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about the one dimensional logarithmic diff diffusion equation with boundary conditions. And this is a joint work with, uh, it's not anymore a student of mine, he already graduated, Cesar Reyes. This was somewhat part of his thesis. So that's what I'm gonna tell you today about. So let me begin here. So this is the logarithmic diffusion equation. Okay, so uh, you will depend on some space variables. Uh, the space variables might be in Rn and a time variable. So it's an evolution equation, right? So here I'm gonna consider just a one dimensional. So the double derivative uh, against x, x is generalized to more dimensions as the Laplacian. So the logarithmic diffusion equation is a partial derivative of u with respect to the time parameter equals to the Laplacian in the spatial variables of the logarithm, logarithm of u. So where does this uh, equ equation comes from, come from? So here is uh, where it, 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 it appears naturally when you consider the equation satisfied by the, I should have said the charge density of a thermalized electron cloud. So you have an electron cloud. You don't. Uh, you suppose that it's it's it's, it's a continuous uh, um, distribution of charge. It's an approximation, and you assume it's thermalized. Thermalized means that it satisfies a Maxwellian uh, density distribution. So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually deduce the equation for you. I'm gonna try. So first of all. If J is the current density and rho is the charge density, the continuity equation says that the divergence, or in this case, the derivative with respect to X of the, of the current density, plus the change in time of the density of the, of the charge, of the charge density is equal to zero. That's the conservation of charge uh, equation. So that's the first one. The second one is Ohm's law. Ohm's law says that the current density is equal to sigma, which is the conductivity times the, the electric field. In this case, if you, if, if you have an electric field, well, you have a, a, an electric potential and the electric field is equal to the gradient of the electric potential, right? Oh, now it comes the hypothesis of being a thermalized uh, electron cloud. This is it. The, Thermalization means that rho satisfies this equation. It comes from a statistical mechanics. This is the Maxwell distribution in this case. Notice that Q is the charge with positive sign of the electron. And this C is just Q times C is potential energy divided by the temperature of the system. And the, that uh, K sub B is just Boltzmann constant. So you, ha you have that... Uh, uh, density of charge satisfies that is more or less the exponential of the, of the potential. So you have Ohm's law, you have continuity equation, you put all together and you get this equation. That's it. That's the logarithmic diffusion equation and it's satisfied by the charge density of a el thermalized electron cloud. Okay. Well, this is, this is a motivation that comes from physics. So now let me go to a motivation that comes from geometry and that's why I started studying this equation. Okay, you have the Ricci flow. Uh, in this case, in a surface, if it's not in a surface, it would be the Yamabe flow, but this is in a, on a surface. So M is a two dimensional manifold, Romanian manifold, and the Ricci flow tells you or, or how to evolve a metric using the Ricci tensor. In this case, the Ricci tensor of a two-dimensional surface is just the product of the scalar curvature times, times the metric itself, okay? 
So if you solve this equation, well, you are flowing the metric throughout the space of metrics. And the, the hope is that you will, you will end up with a nicer metric than the metric you started with. Okay, so G sub G of G, the, the initial condition is the metric you started with and you after, flow, after flowing, you, you expect you will find something nicer. But then as you see, this equation is along metrics that are conformal to the original metric. Because the direction you are flowing towards is always a multiple of the, of the metric you are at that moment of time flowing from. So if you use that, you can rewrite your equation using a conformal factor and you end up with something like this, where this R here is the, I should have put uh, a, a, a sub index is the uh, scalar curvature of the initial metric. And of course the initial metric is one, the, the, at the beginning you have U equals one because at the, at the beginning you have the initial metric, but then, if your met if your initial metric or if you if, if for instance flat then you can suppress this r or you can start flowing not from a, from not from this metric from i mean what i mean is you can uh, assume that this metric is conformally flat so you replace this g naught by a conformally flat metric and then you can suppress this R over here. Of course, you not you at time zero won't be one anymore, but that might be an arbitrary positive function. So the logarithmic diffusion equation arises also as another way of writing the Ricci flow equation when you are working on a surface. Well, if your surface has certain symmetry, for instance, if you are if your initial surface is a cylinder. With S1 symmetry, it means that the, 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 the metric on this cylinder is the product metric of a metric on the circle times the interval. Then this equation, this uh, logarithmic diffusion equation becomes a one dimensional logarithmic diffusion equation. So that's where, uh, that's the geometric motivation I had to study this equation. Okay. So I'm gonna present right away the results we have about the one dimensional logarithmic diffusion equation. It has been studied in other contexts, is saying without boundary conditions, I'm gonna tell you about the boundary conditions next, but it has been studied without boundary conditions in other contexts. And well, it, it has some interesting behavior. It has revealed some interesting behavior. And I, I would like to think that the behavior I'm going to show you now is also interesting. So let's see. So these are the boundary conditions I'm going to impose. This one's in the second line. So you have the logarithmic diffusion equation in one dimension here. And then you say that the derivative, oh, here I, I might be missing a plus and minus in front of the two. So the derivative with respect to x at the, at the end points of the close interval minus, minus all, all to all, which is the, here is this, where the partial uh, variable lives. If you take the derivatives, this is gonna, be, it's gonna be equal to a multiple of a power of u. The case p equals three halves, when p is equal to three halves, corresponds to a boundary value problem to the Ricci flow on a cylinder. And as I said before, with certain symmetry. And gamma, gamma, this gamma here corresponds or is equal to the geodesic curvature of the boundary circles of that cylinder. That's the meaning of this gamma over here, okay? Here I'm gonna make it a constant, but in principle it could be a, a function of x and t as well. Okay. Well, here are the results I was telling you about, here they are. When P is equal to three halves and you start with a positive initial condition, this is a compatibility condition that is needed so that the solutions not only exist, but are sufficiently smooth up to time equals zero, okay? It's just for that, this. 
And notice that this is just the boundary condition rewritten for three halves. So remember the, that when you differentiate logarithm, you are gonna get the U naught downstairs. And when you put it back on the right-hand side, you get the three halves. That's why you see here square root and not the three halves. Okay. Sorry. Well, this condition over here, well, here are the results. This condition over here means that the curvature of the original metric is negative. And this says that the geodesic curvature of the boundary circles is positive. Remember, I'm gonna assume it's a constant. Then solutions to the logarithmic diffusion equation to this one, the one here, over here, with p equals three halves. Solutions to the logarithmic diffusion equation are global in time, so they exist for all time. You have that the minimum, if you compute the minimum of the solution at, it, at, each, at each time, it will blow up at this rate. The maximum of you will blow up at least at this rate, but never faster than this rate. And notice that then the blow up profile is, is, is not flat. It's, it has some interesting features because the maximum or the minimum, when t goes to infinity, it also goes to infinity. The second case is that if the initial condition satisfies this, which means, and we'll see this later in the, in the following uh, 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 slides, if you have this, which means that the curvature of the initial metric is positive, and this, which means that the geodesic curvature of the boundary circles is negative, then solutions to the logarithmic diffusion equation are also global in time. They exist for all time. But this time, they do not blow up. They blow down. That means that the minimum goes to zero. So you see, you cannot have a solution of the logarithmic if, if you if the, if the minimum of the, of the solution to the logarithmic diffusion equation becomes zero at a finite time, you have a problem because you have to compute its logarithm to continue the, the solution. Well, this theorem says, don't worry, it won't happen in, a, in finite time, but in the end, when all ends at infinity, it will reach zero. And the blowdown, this is interesting because this, this is a very fast rate of blowdown. And there are examples, we can produce examples of solutions to the logarithmic diffusion equation that blow down as fast as this, as, as e to the minus d t times t squared. Okay, well, you see this theorem is specialized for exponent three halves. And you could, you could ask yourself, and what happens with other exponents? Well, we can, we can say things about other exponents. Here is what we can say. For instance, using a comparison argument with, the, uh, with solutions to the case p equals 3 halves, we can prove the following. For instance, if p is in between minus infinity and 3 halves, and you have this compatibility condition again, then the solutions to the logarithmic diffusion equation with initial data you know are global, but blows up in infinite time, just as in the case when p is equals three halves and gamma is positive, remember? And here we give some rates of blow up when t goes to infinity. They are not that important, just see, we can compute some rates of blow up, okay? It's interesting that when P is bigger than two, solutions cannot be global. So that's another problem. For exponents bigger than three halves, what's gonna happen is that solutions are not gonna be global. We could prove it for P bigger or equal than two, but then at the end, you, I'll tell you something else. Uh, worry not. When P is, equals than, is bigger, is greater than three halves and gamma is negative, again, you have this compatibility condition, then the solutions to the logarithmic diffusion equation blow down in infinite time. Again, they are gonna be global and they are gonna blow down in infinite time. And we have some rates of blow down for certain special cases. See, but we need this, that this happens at some point. Uh, 
it, that doesn't that it, it that isn't really that important for this talk. So what I'm gonna do <coughs> is gonna present arguments that for some of some parts of this theorem. So I'm gonna like prove bits and pieces of this theorem so you you get a sense or or a feeling on how the arguments work to prove a theorem like this. Okay. That's and then I'm gonna show you how you could prove this theorem using a comparison argument. So just to complete it, to, to round up. Finally, in, in, in not finally, not the end of the talk, but as an application of the previous two theorems, we can prove a long time existence result for the Ricci flow on a cylinder, on any cylinder, on a cylinder with any metric in principle. So you have that you have the cylinder, you have a metric, you have a smooth function from the boundary to the reals. Then you can evolve the, the metric using the Ricci flow. And then you can impose this boundary condition right here that says that the, you can deform also the geodesic curvature of the boundaries. And then you know that, or, or what this result says is that as long as <coughs> phi is smooth and the initial data is smooth, the solution will exist for all time. I mean, a smooth from the boundary times the whole time interval. Then you can deform <coughs> the metric and using the Ricci flow and this solution will exist for all time. So that's an application of the previous two theorems. So you'll see that to prove the first theorem, we use the Ricci flow, we use the geometric ideas and then after we use the Ricci flow to prove those and then a comparison argument to prove the next two theorems I showed you, we use those two theorems to end up proving something about the Ricci flow. It's like we went full circle with the proofs, okay? Well, here we go. We shall sketch bits and parts of the theorems posted in the first slides of this talk. So let's recall the logarithmic diffusion equation. <clears throat> you have it there. And that's the, with the boundary condition. And in this first slide, I'm going to assume that gamma is negative. And of course, I'm going to assume that the initial data, U, not only is positive, but the second derivative of the logarithm of U naught, <clears throat> sorry, is negative as well. So it's a function that looks like this. Yes. Well, I'm just gonna mention how you prove this uh, in a previous paper with uh, a student of mine, Alexander Murcia, about the Ricci flow on a cylinder. We proved that the, for this, pro when, when you have a problem on the cylinder, a Ricci flow on the cylinder with S1 symmetry and the metric at the beginning has positive curvature and the geodesic curvature of the boundaries are constant and negative. It looks like a barrel, imagine a barrel a barrel like this, then the Ricci flow actually exists for all time. The arguments for the proof of this uses uh, some comparison arguments using, uh, uh, sorry, uses the maximum principle on something called the potential function that was introduced by Hamilton himself in his paper on the Ricci flow on surfaces, okay? So you have some little extra problems because you, you have to deal with boundary conditions that also is a mess of things up but then it worked out in this case. So remember that the logarithmic diffusion equation is another way of writing the Ricci flow equation. So using the long time existence for the Ricci flow equation, we end up with the long time existence for the uh, logarithmic diffusion equation. The proof of the blowdown result, remember that this is the case when there is blowdown, requires the construction of some examples that you could also read on, on that paper. I'm not gonna enter into details, okay? But then you have, so that part, that, what, that part of the theorem was mostly done before. So it was easy, okay? Now we go to the case one of the theorem. The case one of the first theorem is when <coughs> gamma was positive, gamma is positive, and the second derivative of the logarithm of the initial condition is negative. That means that the curvature 
of the Ricci flow associated to that logarithmic diffusion equation is positive. So it, it, it sorry, it's negative. So it doesn't look like a barrel anymore. It looks more like, uh, I would say like a hyperboloid, like this, like, okay. And this part is more interesting because to prove long time existence in this case, it wasn't using just the maximum principle. We had to use a compactness argument for the Ricci flow. That's what makes this interesting. This equation, the logarithmic diffusion equation was studied on its own by people working on PDE using techniques from PDE. There are some results using the Ricci flow. That's also true, not in the case when there is boundary, but then when there is boundary to prove long time existence, we, has, we, have, we had to use a compactness argument for a geometric flow. And these compactness arguments have a geometric flavor in the sense that you are actually taking limits of manifolds and metrics on those manifolds, okay? So this is the basic argument. Assume that the scalar curvature of the solution R blows up in finite time. So the scalar, I made a little mistake. I should have written before the formula for R in terms of U. You'll see it in a later slide. But remember, to the logarithmic diffusion equation, there is a Ricci flow associated to it. And then to produce a compactness argument, you may assume that the uh, scalar curvature blows up in finite time. That's what we don't want. We want to show that it doesn't happen. So assume it happens. Sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not more explicit here, but then you take what is called a blow up limit. You have to use gromov hausdorff convergence, derivative estimates on the Ricci flow, blah, blah, blah. But in, in, in the end, you produce a blow up limit. And when you do that blow up limit, from, starting from the cylinder, you end up with something that is R2, with a metric of negative curvature. Remember that, we that this Ricci flow has negative curvature or a half plane because it might have boundary. So this case is when you do a, this, this case, when you get R2 is, is the case that happens when you blow up and you end up without the boundary. But you might end up with the boundary and the boundary, and when you end up with the boundary in this case, you get a half plane. But this half plane has totally geodesic boundaries. So you can glue it to itself and produce a, a whole plane. But then when you have a, whole, a solution to the Ricci flow in R2 on the time interval minus infinity, infinity to infinity, yes, it has non-negative curvature. And that's the contradiction. So you started with a flow that has had negative curvature. If the curvature blows up, it, it implies that the curvature goes to minus infinity. When you rescale and produce your blow up limit, your blow up limit will have negative curvature. But that cannot be because when you have an eternal solution to the Ricci flow, it has to have non negative curvature. So you, the curvature does not blow up. As the curvature does not blow up, the conformal factor remains bounded. And so you can continue a solution forever. And what's interesting about this proof is that this not only proves or shows that the solution cannot blow up in finite time, it doesn't, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the curvature does not blow up in finite time, it does not blow up in infinite time either. The conformal factor might blow up in infinite time because the conformal factor is actually, I'll show you how, how you get the conformal factor from, from the curvature but the conformal factor is the exponential of an integral of the curvature in the interval of time that you want to compute the conformal factor. So the conformal factor might blow up in infinite time, whereas the curvature might not blow up in infinite time. But if the curvature does not blow up in finite time, the conformal factor do not blow, does not blow up in finite time either. Let me see. See here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you also the blow up rates, how you compu compute blow up rates in this case. But look, this is what I was telling you about. Look at formula two. In formula two tells you how the scalar curvature is related to the conformal factor. And three tells you how the conformal factor is related to the curvature. That's why if the curvature does not blow up in finite time, 
the conformal factor does not blow up in finite time. Whereas if the curvature does not blow up in finite time, the conformal factor in principle could blow up or blow down, okay? So, so let me show you then how you can get a, let me see what time, okay, 23 minutes. <clears throat> blow up rates from these formulas for the, for the, for the, for the logarithmic diffusion equation, okay? So here they are. You have an area. See, you, I'm gonna use some geometric, in, geometric intuition to prove this. So you have the area. The area is basically the, the integral of the conformal factor. I put the theta here because in principle, you don't need to have rotational symmetry, but in this case, you don't need it because we have rotational symmetry. So it's constant along theta. And we introduce this new quantity here, which is the average of the scalar curvature at the boundary components, okay? So we can ca calculate, compute using the, rich, the using the logarithmic diffusion equation and these equations over here and some integration by parts to get this. And what this shows is that the second derivative of the area with respect to time is that integral over there. But then if you integrate, somewhat twice, if you integrate twice, you get this. As long as this A prime is not zero, which is basically, or never is, this A prime at zero is not zero, you see that the area is starts, it starts growing linearly. And if the area grows, up, grow, grow, grows, grows linearly, actually you can show that the maximum of the conformal factor has to blow up linearly, but in infinite time, okay? That's remember that case one in the first theorem is when this R is negative, okay? And this gamma is positive. So with this minus sign here, the whole quantity becomes positive. But as I said, the, if, you, if, you re, <laughs> if you recall the theorem, I'm gonna recall it for you here. The maximum, I said that the maximum blowed up at with an exponent three halves here instead of an exponent one. So how can you improve this uh, blow up rate? Well, we use this. This formula, when you have the Ricci flow, sorry, associated to the logarithmic diffusion equation that I wrote at the beginning with P equals three halves, this is the equation satisfied by the normal derivative of the curvature with respect to the unit outward normal. So you have this formula here. And you have this formula for the evolution equation of the curvature. So you start with your logarithmic diffusion equation. It is right, you have the Ricci flow equation associated to it, which is derivative of G with respect to time of the metric with respect to time is minus the scalar curvature times the metric. And if you have the boundary condition you had there, that is reflected on this boundary condition for the Ricci flow. So you have this in the interior, this at the boundary, right? And notice that as R is negative, and of course we have to show that it remains negative throughout the flow. I'm not gonna do that, I'm just gonna say it. This fact here implies that the maximum, maximum cannot occur at the boundary component. So it occurs at the interior. So if you use the fact that at the maximum, the Laplacian is non-positive, then you can erase, delete this Laplacian here from here, and then you get this inequality, this differential inequality for the maximum of, this, of the curvature. And you can integrate that inequality. That's what you get if you integrate that inequality. But remember, the maximum has to happen at the interior. So the maximum that not, does not occur at the boundary points. So the average of the curvature at the boundary components has, is going to be less than the maximum of the curvature. So put a minus here in front of R max, put a minus here in front of B over one minus BT. The, the, the inequality sign is gonna change, but then use the fact that the, this is smaller than the maximum, 
then this is going to be larger than the maximum minus this, pardon, sorry, minus R sub uh, now, uh, delta here, minus R sub delta is going to be larger than minus R max. So you get this inequality. It's just playing with algebra. But then that inequality is what's going to give us <coughs> the, uh, the blow up rate. Look. Again, you play with geometric quantities like as the length. So you take the derivative of the length with respect to time, you get this. You integrate. You can rewrite the derivative of the area as this. Okay? But then look at this. You have then that A prime is larger or equal than uh, this symbol says that up to a constant, this is larger than whatever is on this side. That's the meaning of that symbol. So if you take this part exponent of this and you put it there, because it's here also, you get that the derivative of the area is bigger or equal than this, up to a constant. But then remember, uh, if you integrate this, uh, uh, right. Uh, something is wrong with this yogurt. I'm, I'm missing one step. Anyway, oh, well, oh right, no, that's okay. Uh, oh, logarithm. Yeah, I, 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 yes, this step is, is, it doesn't matter. In the end, of course, <clears throat> you have to integrate this, you get this, and then once you integrate this, you get that the derivative of, sorry, of course. The area prime is without this integral here. It's a square root of one minus B T. And then to get the area, to get the area, you have to integrate that. I mean, yes, I, I, I'm missing one. I, I went one step further without realizing it. This derivative is bigger or equal than the integrand. And then you integrate both sides to get this. That's what you get. So yeah, I, I was, I, 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 <clears throat> I went too far. I, 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 I went ahead of myself when I wrote this. Well, anyway. But then from the fact that the area grows faster than T2, the three halves, using this, remember that the area is the integral of U basically, right? Then you get this. So you get the, 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 the blow up rate for the, the maximum of the conformal factor. But that's not the end of the story. You can actually show that the conformal factor actually grows up faster than t squared. But I won't do that in this case. Okay. But then using geometric reasoning, you get a blow up rate for the conformal factor, which is the solution to the logarithmic diffusion equation. To get an upper bound, remember that I said that the blow up cannot be faster than something, than an exponential of t. All you have to recall is that the compactness argument showed that the curvature remains uniformly bounded in the whole existence, in the whole uh, interval of uh, time interval, uh, sorry, in the whole interval of existence of the solution. That's what's written here. So using this formula for the curvature and integrating, you get that the conformal factor cannot grow faster than an exponential function of t. So you cannot go faster than that. And for the lower bound, we again use this, you know, and we have a, a for R max, and then we can use the, the relation between the conformal factor and the curvature to get this. So you see, we get that the maximum blows up at least faster than T to the three halves. In this last inequality, we showed that the minimum blows up faster than T. But what happens is that there is a theorem by Topping and G that says that in these cases, when you have uh, the, uh, um, you get the solution at an interior point, it cannot grow faster than T at an interior point. We know now that the blow up of U happens, is, is getting closer and closer to the boundary. But at the center where is the minimum, the blow up is not that fast. It's just as fast as T. 
So that's why you don't get a flat profile at blow up. So at infinity. <coughs> okay, so that's part one, case one. And to next, I'm gonna I, I want to show you in what's left. Uh, let's see if I'm okay. okay. Is how you can use the theorems proof for exponent three halves to extend them to other exponents. And the whole thing is that you can use this comparison theorem that says, suppose you have two solutions to the logarithmic diffusion equation, satisfying these boundary inequalities. Notice that we have the same F. So you have two solutions of the logarithmic diffusion equation. One says derivative of U with respect to T is equal to two derivatives of the logarith logarithm of U. And you have the derivative of V with respect to T is equal to two derivatives with respect to F, X to, of the logarithm of V. And you also have this. this. This eta here means that the derivatives with respect to x, but uh, uh, it would be the derivative with respect to the exterior normal. But remember that in an interval, in, a, in an interval, the exterior normals on the right hand side is ddx, and on the left hand side is minus ddx. So this, in the, the, with this notation, I encapsulate both notions, okay? So you have these two inequalities, then one solution to the logarithmic uh, diffusion equation is gonna remain larger than the other, as long as both exist, okay? So let's see. Then so now let's go back to the case when you have solution to the logarithmic diffusion equation and you have that gamma is positive. Now I'm not gonna ask for the second derivative of the initial condition to be less than zero. Sorry, bigger than zero. I'm not gonna ask for that. Just that gamma is positive and the exponent I'm gonna I'm considering in the nonlinearity at the boundary is less than three halves. So we proceed as follows. Take delta bigger than zero and then P write it as this, write it as this, as three halves minus delta, your P. Now, choose any B node that satisfies the assumptions of theorem one, part one. What does it mean? B not the function I'm gonna compare the sol U to, is gonna be a solution to the logarithmic diffusion equation, but now with exponent three halves. And also I'm gonna ask that the second derivative of the logarithm of B naught is in this case uh, positive. So B naught is satisfies the conditions, the assumptions that B naught has to satisfy in the, in, the, in the first theorem I showed you in the slides. And I take the solution to the logarithmic, logarithmic diffusion equation with P equals three halves, okay? So I have three half minus delta, that's P, but B satisfies the logarithmic diffusion equation with P equals three halves. And then this is a technicality. I'm, assume I'm, I'm gonna compare directly U to V. This is just a technicality. I have to, whatever. But, but what I need is notice that B eventually is gonna be larger than T because it blows up at that rate, the minimum blows up at that rate. So at some point, V is gonna be very large. So at some point, V is gonna be larger than the maximum of one and the maximum of U naught. So I'm gonna exchange V naught as the initial condition by V at time T, capital T, that's all. It's just, so I'm gonna wait until V is larger than the initial condition for U and that's gonna be my new initial condition for V, that's all. That's what I'm saying there. So my new initial condition is B, but taking at time T, capital T. So the solution to the logarithmic diffusion equation with this initial data is exactly V, but displaced by capital T, that's all. But notice that W naught is larger than U naught. And notice this inequality, DW, the derivative with respect to eta is this because it satisfies the logarithmic diffusion equation with p equals three halves. But notice I took advantage of this one of, of w being larger than one and max 
you know, to take this o W to the delta here and get rid of it to get this inequality. So now I have two solutions to the logarithmic. I have two solutions to the logarithmic diffusion equation. One is U, which satisfies that its normal derivative is exactly equal to two times gamma. U raised to the three halves minus delta. And I have another solution, which is W, but this solution does not satisfy an inequality, satisfies an inequality, this inequality. So I use the comparison principle with this F, and that shows that W is always above U. As long as they are evolving, W is always above U, but W never blows up in finite time. So U does not blow up in finite time, does not blow up in finite time. Okay, so in that, on that side, we are okay because it's not blowing up, but what could be happening? It could be happening that U at some point is reaching zero in finite time, it's becoming zero in finite time. It does not happen either because of the maximum principle, and this is a straightforward application of the maximum principle, so I'm gonna leave it there. So in any finite interval of time, U does not blow up and it does not reach the value zero. So it does exist for all time. The solution is global. So from the first theorem, which was specifically for three halves, I could extend it to other exponents by comparison. But I do not have, uh, in principle, I wouldn't have the geometric arguments to prove a blow up rate. So we have to use some other analytic arguments. Okay, so, but that's not, not to worry here. Not to, I don't wanna, uh, how do you say? bore you with that. <laughs> but, ah, okay, so as you see, I started this talk throwing theorems at you. Okay, we have the logarithmic diffusion equation, and this is what we proved. And you say, oh my God, this guy, is, uh, he this hasn't, does not even acknowledge other people's work. Well, because I wanted to leave it to, for the end, to the, for the ending, okay? So I'm gonna acknowledge just one piece of work. There has been other works uh, for the logarithmic diffusion equation, without boundary conditions or with Dirichlet boundary conditions, not with this type of boundary conditions. You can read, for, for instance, uh, Juan Luis Vasquez, a Spanish mathematician. He, he, he has written a lot about these equations, but he has not specifically considered this problem. Uh, but then I, you know, thanks to the tech, uh, information, uh, access, the, the access to information we have in these modern times, I started looking for, you know, you, you don't wanna prove something without acknowledging that someone might have done it before. So you don't have to waste your time trying to publish a paper. So I, I went on a hunt. It took, me, it took me some time until I dig out, dug out the works of Noemi Wolanski. And this is one author, and these are two authors. I mean, Wolanski wrote a paper about this type of equations. And these two guys found, according to them, a mistake in Wolanski's work, although Wolanski's work the theorems were correct, the proofs were not according to these two guys, okay? I, I haven't checked. They studied this equation, notice, it's almost the same. Just they added a logarithmic, a logarithmic factor here. So it's not exactly the equation we were considering, but it's almost the same. And they discovered, notice also that here gamma, two gamma is one. So they are only considering the case when gamma is positive. That's another thing. I couldn't find a, a bibliography when gamma was negative. But when, what did they prove? They proved that when alpha is less or equal than one half, then the solutions are global. So we could have proved part two of theorem one, the, the first slide I showed you, using, perhaps using a comparison argument with, this, with solutions to this problem, okay? And then we would get that for three halves, you also have global solutions, okay? But when alpha is strictly larger than one half, there is blow up in finite time. They do not uh, uh, study the blow up rates when the solution is global, it has to happen. If the solutions are global, blow up has to occur an infinite time. Well, yes, because you have a Lyapunov uh, uh, function for this type of problems in dimension one but not in, in, in all dimensions, well, that's okay. And they 
also show when in the one dimensional case, they show for some initial data and some technical restrictions, they describe the asymptotic behavior near, a, near the blow up time for solutions to this equation when they blow up in finite time. So that's all I could fi find about these works or something similar of about what I told you in the, in, in the, in the previous parts of the talk. But then this, I, I found this, this is very interesting work in, in, I, and uh, I found, found it quite interesting actually. Well, I think that's it. These are the, this is, these are the references. Uh, here is the, the, this second paper is where the, most of the talk was taken from. This is the paper where we prove the things about the cylinder. This is the beautiful paper, the Hamilton about Ritchie flow on surfaces that gave us many ideas to work on this first paper. Uh, this here is where the name barrel came from. We, we adopted the name barrel since this paper for the for the uh, me a metric on the on the cylinder that looks like this: <laughs> positive curvature, negative geodesic curvature. And this is the work of Wang and Wu. There you will find a reference about Volansky's work if you are interested in. And that's it. And I swear I put a slide that said thank you. But anyway, I will say I will tell I will say it. Thank you for listening. And that's it. If you have any questions. <laughs>